Well, good morning. I'm glad to have all of you here at Central Campus and those of you worshiping online with us. Thanks for joining us today. He and his brother were raised by their single mother who worked two, sometimes three jobs to provide for their family. Although his mother left school in the third grade, she knew that a good education was key to the success of her two sons. Although she, had it dif she found it difficult to read them, she required her sons to read two books a week and give a written report that she had to read, although she only had a third grade education. This man overcame poverty and racism and soon began to understand the power of learning and eventually won a full academic scholarship to Yale and then attended University of Michigan School of Medicine where he chose to become a neurosurgeon. He gained fame in the medical world in 1987 when he successfully separated a seven-month-old conjoined twins who were joined at the back of their heads. Over the next couple of decades, his medical reputation and expertise became renowned throughout the globe. You know that I speak of this man. His name is Dr. Ben Carson. Dr. Carson has written several books, and in each of his books, you'll find that he is a man of great faith, unapolog unapologetically proclaiming his love for the Lord Jesus. During the Trump administration, Dr. Carson served as the secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Dr. Carson had a really, really rough start in life, in poverty with a single mom. He overcame what would seem to be insurmountable odds to become a world-renowned surgeon and became the director of pediatric neurosurgery, pediatric neurosurgery, say that fast five times, at the John Hopkins, John Hopkins Children's Center in 1984. And listen to this, at age 33, he was the youngest chief of pediatric neurosurgery in the United States, 33 years old, and he's the boss, pretty cool. God uses all kind of people to do his work, even when they come from the most difficult and frustrating circumstances. Today we conclude our series, Unknown, from the book of Judges, as we've studied predominantly folks that are not everyday names we hear, save Gideon alone perhaps. But we've studied names we don't really know, and we do that again today. A man who overcame a very rough start, just like Dr. Carson overcame a rough start. So if you have your Bibles, either your hard copy, which I have, or your electronic, would you take it and find Judges? Judges is in the Old Testament, and if you'll find Judges 11, that's where we'll read today and study today. Joshua, Judges, Ruth. There we go. It's in uh, page 213 in my Bible. <laughs> Judges 11, 1. Hope you'll join us at home with your copy of God's Word. 11, 1, Judges, I begin. Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also bore him sons, not the prostitute, his wife. And when they were grown up, they drove Jephthah away. They said this, you're not going to get any inheritance in our family because you're the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob where a group of adventurers gathered around him and followed him. Sometime later, when the Ammonites went to war with Israel, the elders of Gilead, that Gilead also represents the larger context of the nation of Israel, the elders of Israel went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob and said, come, be our commander and fight against the Ammonites. Come save us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this great series we've been studying that all of us, whether we have any name recognition in this world or not, when we surrender to you, you can do wonderful things through our lives and in our lives, and we're grateful for that. So Lord, one more time, would you enable our minds to understand and our hearts to grasp and our spirits and will to, to be challenged that God, wherever we have come from, whatever we have experienced, we will say yes to your presence in our life and be available for you to use us for your kingdom. So help us today as we study your word. Lord, give my mind clarity, my mouth to be articulate, to communicate your word. Help me, fill me, 
Fill me with your spirit, Lord. I need you. In your name I pray. Amen. A rough start and a great finish. If you're taking notes at home or here at Central Campus, a rough start and a great finish is the title of today's message. So let's jump right in as we study and look at verse 1. Jephthah, a Gileadite, and a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His mom was a prostitute. That's where we start today in the first one. I mean, that's not the first thing you and I want to be said about us. My mom works a vocation that's not... It's not looked on very well. Jephthah had a rough start. If anybody had a rough start, he had a rough start. If you're taking notes, that's the first thought. Jephthah had a rough start. I wonder what it was like to be him. Now, we don't have a full context, but if we use our imagination and probabilities in our mind, I think we can get a picture. If your mom's a prostitute, he didn't live with his father. We know that. So all of his life growing up is he had a father who didn't care where he was, and his brothers were over there, his half-brothers, and he was over here. In other words, he lived on the wrong side of the tracks. His brothers had all the niceties of life. They went to the nicest schools. They wore the nicest clothes. They got to go on the nicest trips, and he didn't. Hey, it's obvious that everybody in town knows this. It's not a secret. Everybody knows that he doesn't belong with them. He's over there. Maybe he probably most likely grew up in a brothel. How else would it be? Most likely, it was a difficult and frustrating life. There are times, ladies and gentlemen, at home and at Central, we don't get a fair shake. He didn't bring this on himself. He didn't ask for this. This is the result of his father's poor choice. There are times when things just don't go well for us, and you and I, in those moments, even when other people are making decisions that put us in a negative situation, a frustrating situation, you and I have to decide this. We can do nothing about what happened to us, but we can do a whole lot about what happens through us. Am I willing to say, God, I can get past that, I can forgive those who have hurt me even if they don't ask and I can move on to the best you have for my life. That's exactly what Jephthah did and you and I have to do the same. You see, even with a rough start, even with a frustrating start, even with a hurtful start, you and I can allow God to do wonderful things in and through us but we have to choose to. So we see that he had a rough start. Let's see what happens next in his life. Jephthah, he makes the best of his rough beginnings. Now, it'd be really easy to be really bitter. Your dad's got money and his, half, his sons from their mother, my half-brothers, they've got the good life and I don't have it. Man, that, that could make a guy grow up bitter. That could make a guy grow up defeated. That could make a guy grow up and quit on life, but he didn't. Look at these two words in verse 1. A mighty warrior. A mighty warrior. In other words, he didn't sit home and suck his thumb and cry. He said in his own life, I'm going to do something with the situation I have. And think about it. There's a reputation. How do you know he had a reputation? Well, Jephthah made it in the Bible. How many of y'all made it in the Bible? Not many do. The dude had a reputation. God thought it so much that Jephthah would allow God to work in his life that he said, I'm going to put him in to teach you people a long time later. That's good stuff. And so instead of laying down and quitting and being bitter and being mad and, and, and hating his dad and hating his brothers, he said, you know what? I don't have a good start, but I'm going to do the best I can. And he trained himself in the art of war and became a mighty warrior, so much so that he had a reputation of being a man who could take care of himself. He didn't get better, bitter, he got better. Now, unfortunately, as probably in his young adulthood, maybe a late teenager, I don't know how old, we don't know the context, but he had another setback. Life sometimes doesn't just hit you once or twice, sometimes it hits you three times and it keeps throwing negative blows at you. Sometimes, sometimes you make decisions that bring consequences on you and you can understand it. When you make the mistake, you say, well, I shouldn't have done that, now I have... Now I'm bearing the consequences. But it's harder when somebody else does something and I'm bearing the consequences. So there's another setback. Look in verse 2 and 3. Gilead's wife 
also bore him sons over there on the good side of the tracks in the biggest and nicest neighborhood, not over here in the bad neighborhood. And when those sons grew up, they say to Jephthah, we're sending you out of town. They all gang up and drive him out of town. You're not gonna get any inheritance from our dad because you're the son of that other woman. Now, everybody knows it. It's not a secret in town. But Jephthah, so Jephthah, to save his own life, has to leave his, his he, I'm sure he had a peer group of friends. I don't know how old he was, young adult. He flees, he flees, he fled. That's Dixon 101. He flees from everybody. Yeah, yeah. Y'all come try this sometime. The lights are in your eyes and there's a TV camera on you. And, uh, he runs from his brothers and he settles in Tob where a group of adventurers, other guys who may not have been first in their class, all gather around him because he's a leader. Now, after suffering through what had been the rough and difficult childhood, now he's a young man and things seem to go from bad to worse for this man, Jephthah. Now, Jephthah is a young man. He's made something of himself. He has a reputation of being a mighty warrior and his half-brothers, because of their greed and their meanness, and they're cold hearts. They run him out saying, you're not getting any of our dad's money. Get out of this town. Again, he didn't bring it on himself. Somebody else brought the pain on him. You see, it, it's easier to understand when we make the mistake, we make the poor choice, and then we suffer the consequences. It's harder when somebody else causes us this situation. That's harder to get over. This hardship was not a result of his bad decision, but of his brother's meanness. Sometimes life is just hard. And sometimes there's no explanation. And uh, if we're not careful, we can just really get angry at life. But you got to be careful. We got to be careful. You got to just say, God, help me. God, help me. Matter of fact, there's a thing that we need to practice if you're not in the habit of it. When people hurt you, as soon as you can bring yourself to do it, you need to forgive them. Because you don't want them, what they did then, yesterday, to affect who you are today and who you should be growing to become tomorrow. Well, Tom, they never ask forgiveness. Don't matter. Doesn't matter if they ask forgiveness. You can forgive them before they ever speak to you. If they never speak to you, you forgive them. Because if you harbor bitterness in your heart, you're the loser, not them. Because you lock yourself up in anger and frustration and sometimes self-pity. That doesn't lessen the fact that the pain you feel is real, the hurt you experience is real, and what they did was awful. I'm not lessening that. But how can you allow God and his Holy Spirit to let you take the next step to forgive them so you can go on to become all he wants you to become? I remember when Phil Fulmer got fired from UT Knoxville. It's been a long time since we had a winning team, huh? He was only 150 and 50. 75% of the games he coached, he won. We hadn't had that in two decades. Do you know what he said when they fired him? Some reporter said, hey, does it, does it make you bitter when they do that and they fired you? And he says, listen, he says, for me to get bitter is for like me to drink poison and expect the other guy to die. For me to get bitter at what they did is for me to drink poison and think they're going to get harmed. So don't let that happen. Let's not let that happen. So here's a surprise. Look what happens. Jephthah is asked to lead. Now if you look down in, in verse 4 in 11 Judges. Sometime later, when the Ammonites are fighting against Israel, the elders of Gilead, and remember Gilead represents the larger community of Israel, the elders of Israel went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob, and then they say, verse 6, come, they said, be our commander so we can fight the Ammonites. Verse 9, he answered, suppose you take me back to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gives me the victory. You know, I know God is going to have to help me to get the victory. He's a man of faith, obviously. He doesn't say, I can do it. He says, the Lord gives them to me. Will I really be your leader? Will I be head over you? Will you make me a judge? That he does become a judge, by the way, for six years, I think. And the elders of Gilead of Israel said, yes, the Lord is our witness. We make this oath before the Lord. You will certainly be our leader if indeed God gives you the victory over the Ammonites, our enemy. So here's a here's a. Here's a great thing for us to learn. Jephthah didn't get bitter or close his heart or his ears to the cries of his own nation when they needed his help, even after they kicked him out of town. Now, this is amazing. Jephthah's brothers ran him out because of their greed 
and their meanness, and the elders of the community watched this atrocity, this in injustice, this injustice take place, and they sat around twiddling their thumbs and did nothing. Now these same elders who ruled over the city, over the, the community, didn't do a thing when, when, uh, when this guy's run out, and now when things turn bad, they know he's a mighty wonder, they go for his help. Do you know what I might have done? If they're coming to me asking for my help when they ran me out of town and ran me away from what I knew and made me go to a new town and they come now begging for my help, you know what? I, yeah, right. I mean, I would just say, uh, no. I would have like, I would have like, I wanted to pop them upside their head like that, just slap them like the three stooges. Boop, whoop, 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 whoop. You kids Google that. You never heard of the three stooges. That's why God invented Google so you can find out classic stuff like three stooges. Remember that? Yeah. Whoop, 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 whoop. There it is. Whoop, 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 whoop. That's what I would have wanted to do. I want to slap him in their head, but he doesn't do that. You know, if you look at this, and then, and you can't get every word, but you can get the context. If you look at this, I mean, the guy had had a rough childhood. His mom was a prostitute, never included in anything with his dad, discarded as, as unused, unneeded. He, he, he makes a warrior of himself, then gets kicked out of his own town and has to start over with another group. And look at this. The guy listens and says, okay. Do you know what it tells me about him? It, it tells me this guy's mature. This guy's not an infant in his emotional state. He's, he's an intellectual. He can think. He can listen and reason. I mean, he, 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 even after all of his rough experience and setbacks, sometimes God surprises you. And I'm sure he was surprised. He, in the, in, not in a long shot did he think this was happening or would happen, but when it did, he said, okay, let's talk about this. That shows some great maturity. Do you and I, those of you at home and those of you here at Central on, on campus, do, do we think like that? Do, do we have that kind of emotional maturity even when those who have done us wrong come back and say help us? Are we willing to have that conversation? Or do we discard people and say hey I'm never talking to you again? So God surprises Jephthah with this opportunity to go from running around with a bunch of adventurers out of town and to come back and actually be the boss, the leader. Look at what God can take you from and take you to. So just for a minute, and this is mostly for folks that have a, a little bit of, it can be for any age, but mostly for those of you who are long in the tooth and gray in the head. Think about this in your life. Think about where you were, what not great decisions you made, and then what decisions other people made that affected you and put you in a frustrating, struggling, hurtful situation, and then fast forward to where you sit and where you are, and more importantly, who you are today. I mean, see, can, isn't that amazing what God can do, how he can take you from where is not a good spot to where you are today? I'm not saying we've arrived yet, but man, we're a long way from where we used to be. Can, can I get a witness with anybody? Anybody experience the goodness of God, and I think where I was and where I am? See, the beauty is, is not much what I do, the beauty is, is who I am in Christ. Because God's way more concerned about who I am than what I do. Because what I do can be glorifying to God when I got the who I am in Christ right. And he can take me from a not good place to a good place in his kingdom. And he's done that with a lot of you, and he's still doing that in a lot of us. He's, you see, walking with Christ is a process. God uses events but it's really a process. Jephthah ac accepted the invitation and he went to lead Israel against the Ammonites. Look at, look at this next thought. Jephthah tries to reason with the enemy. Now, 12 to 28, Judges 11. It, this is a long set of verses. I'm not gonna read them. Let me just give you a, a, a synopsis of them, okay? Uh, this is the first Timothy version. They... Uh, he could have, because he's a mighty warrior and because Israel asked, he could have just went over and assembled all the troops and immediately he could have just tried to annihilate the Ammonites because they're messing with his nation, but he didn't. 
He tried to negotiate a treaty, if you read those verses. Basically, he said, let's work it out so we can get along. There's no need for hundreds or thousands of people to die. And then they said, well, you're taking our property. And what he said, hey, let me remind you of what really happened. And he takes him back all the way to when Israel came out of Egypt. And he said, listen, my forefathers came out of Egypt. And we simply said, we want to pass through your property. And when we come through, if you read it, you can actually read about it in Exodus when they came out. He says, we were willing to pay you for water. We were going to stay on the path. We would pay you for anything we eat on our way through. Remember, they had money. The money they had was the gold and the jewels. The Egyptians gave them on the way out. So they weren't destitute. They had gold and jewelry, silver. And, uh, and, and then what the Ammonites do? They did not let them have passage through their country. So the Ammonites, the Ammonites came to attack them, and then God just whipped them. God uses Israel to whip them and just take that land. And so basically what this man says, what Jephthah says to the Ammonite leader, says, you started the fight, and God allowed us to punch you in the mouth. We won the fight, so the property's ours, and we're willing to work it out if you will. And they refused. What I like about it is is when a man or a woman or a person is mature, our first response, even to those who don't wish us well, is not this. It's this. Anytime and every time you and I can, let's put out the hand of friendship, the the hand of of negotiation, the the hand of unity, the the hand of let's find a way to work this out. And, And there are times, there are a few times in life when they refuse and they attack, and then you have to do this. But but make it the last resort and, and make it only when God gives you the freedom to do that. See, most of the time he's trying to do the amiable way, the, the best way, the, where nobody, where fewer people get hurt. I mean, he knows there are hundreds, if not thousands, will die, and they, weren't, they aren't willing. So, you know what he does. You know, he starts rough, and he finishes well. He, he, he just goes to work and defeats the enemy. Jephthah defeats the enemy. If you look at verse 32 and 33, just real clear, then Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites because they wouldn't negotiate. They wouldn't come to a peace agreement. And the Lord gave them into his hands. The Lord did it. Was he a mighty warrior? Yes, but the Lord did it. He devastated 20 towns. And thus, Israel subdued Ammon. Now, Ammon is serving them. And instead of being in a friendship, instead of being in a negotiated peace treaty, now they're slaves. Because Ammonites were hard-headed, and Jephthah tried to give them a chance, and they wouldn't, so he whipped them. God allowed them to punch them in the mouth. But look back at verse 29. That's important, most important. Jephthah defeats the enemy, but why and how? Verse 29 says, the Spirit of the Lord came over Jephthah. See, that's how it took place. Even as a mighty warrior, he couldn't win this battle. It's God on him that allows him to win the battle. See, whatever battle you find you're fighting in your life, whatever it is, whatever struggle, whatever hurt, whatever hardship, whatever mountain or hurdle, you're finding yourself having to climb or jump or crawl over, it is key that you have the Spirit of the Lord on you. Do you understand that we are spiritual beings housed in a physical body. We're, we're not physical beings that have a spirit. We're spiritual beings that are housed in a physical body. What, I, what I'm talking about is, is that we're just passing through. And you're going to sit setbacks and hardships and frustrating times. But if you allow the Spirit of God to lead you and guide you and fill you, you're going to make it over every hurdle until God calls you home. the one because God was on him. And that's it. So the, the question is, is, is not can I win or not? The question is, do I have God on me and in me? Then he takes care of the results because he's sovereign. Because he's sovereign. You know, there have been many great men and great women throughout history who have overcome tragedy, overcome hardship, over, overcome difficulties to go on to do great, great things. His mother died when he was nine years old. He lost his job in 1832. He was defeated for state legislature. Late, late, again, I'm having trouble. 
the state legislature in 1832, failed in business in 1833, elected to state legislature in 1834. His sweetheart died in 1835. He had a nervous breakdown in 1836. He was defeated for nomination for Congress in 1843. He was elected to Congress in 1846. He lost renomination in 1848, rejected as land officer for 1849, defeated for U.S. Senate in 1854, defeated for nomination for vice president in 1856, defeated again for U.S. Senate in 1858, and he was elected president of the United States in 1860. You know, I'm talking about Abraham Lincoln, who was perhaps the greatest of all presidents of the United States. Abraham Lincoln led our nation to end the terrible tragedy, the atrocity of slavery. When you look at history and you see men like Ben Carson, we look at men like Abraham Lincoln, we look at men like Jephthah, we look at women like Deborah, just you, you look at them throughout history and you see that, that the important lesson to learn is not where you start or not what keeps you down early or what your struggles or your hurts are. And I'm not doubting that they're real, but the truth is, is how you let God help you finish strong. You see, from a rough start to a great finish. And the beauty of this is, listen to me, the beauty of this is, it doesn't matter where you are on your journey. It doesn't matter if you're 20 or 50 or 80. You've always got tomorrow and eternity. So how about it? Are you letting anything from yesterday, recent or yesterday, distant past, lock you up and keeping you from becoming the best you that God wants you to be? See, that's the question. That's the question. The easy moral lesson of this story, it doesn't matter how you start. What matters is how you finish. Doesn't matter what your trials or tribulations or heartaches or failures that life gives you. And we're not downplaying their pain. They're real. But what matters is how you respond to them. I said it a week or two ago. You see, you... Life is going to hit you. It rains on the just and the unjust. It's not what happens to you. It, it's what you allow God to do through you. It starts with his spirit. And we just simply say, Lord, it's okay if I'm unknown, like Jephthah or Deborah or Ehud or whomever. God, I'm available. I'm available. Do something in me. Do something through me.